Book 5. Diomed Fights the Gods. Then Pallas Athena granted Tydea son Diomed strength and daring, so the fighter would shine forth and tower over the Argives and win himself great glory. She set the man ablaze, his shield and helmet flaming with tireless fire like the star that flames at harvest, bathed in the ocean, rising up to outshine all other stars. Such fire Athena blazed from Tydide's head and shoulders, drove him into the center where the masses struggled on. There was a Trojan, Dares, a decent, wealthy man, the god Hephaestus priest who had bred two sons, Phegeus and Ideas, trained for every foray. Breaking ranks they rushed ahead in their chariot, charging Diams already dismounted, rearing up on foot. They went for each other fast, close range, Phegeus hurled first, his spear's shadow flew and over Tydides' left shoulder the tip passed and never touched his body. Tydides hurled next, the bronze launched from his hand and not for nothing, hitting Phegeus' chest between the nipples it pitched him out behind his team. Ideas leapt, abandoned the handsome car but did not dare to stand and defend his dead brother and not even so would he have fled his black death but the god of fire swept him off and saved him, shrouding the man in night so the old priest would not be wholly crushed with one son left. But high-hearted Tydides drove away the team and gave them to aids to lash both horses back to the hollow ships. And now despite their courage the Trojan fighters seeing the two sons of Dares, one on the run, one dead beside his chariot, all their hearts were stunned. But Athena, eyes bright, taking ours in hand, called the violent god away with, ours, ours, destroyer of men, reeking blood, stormer of ramparts, why not let these mortals fight it out for themselves? Let Zeus give glory to either side he chooses. We'll stay clear and escape the father's rage. And so, luring the headlong ours off the lines Athena sat him down on Scamander's soft, sandy banks while Argives bent the Trojans back. Each captain killed his man. First Agamemnon lord of men spilled the giant Odeus, chief of the Halizonians off his car, the first to fall, as he veered away the spearhead punched his back between the shoulders, gouging his flesh and jutting out through his ribs, he fell with a crash, his armor rang against him. Idomeneus cut down Phaestus, Meonian bore a son who shipped to Troy from the good rich earth of Tame. As he tried to mount behind his team the famous spearman stabbed a heavy javelin deep in his right shoulder, he dropped from his war car, gripped by the hateful dark. Then as Idomeneus' henchmen stripped the corpse Menelaus took Scamandrius down with a sharp spear, Strophius' son, a crack marksman skilled at the hunt. Artemis taught the man herself to track and kill wild beasts, whatever breeds in the mountain woods, but the huntress showering arrows could not save him now nor the archer's long shots, his forte in days gone by. No, now Menelaus the great spearman ran him through, square between the blades as he fled and raced ahead, tearing into his flesh, drilling out through his chest he crashed face down, his armor clanged against him. Meriones killed Fairclus, son of Tecton, son of the blacksmith Harmon the fighter's hands had the skill to craft all kinds of complex work since Pallas Athena loved him most, a protégé who had built Paris his steady, balanced ships, trim launches of death, freighted with death for all of Troy and now for the shipwright too, what could the man know of all the gods' decrees? Meriones caught him quickly, running him down hard and speared him low in the right buttock, the point pounding under the pelvis, jabbed and pierced the bladder, he dropped to his knees, screaming, death swirling round him. Megs killed Padeus, Antinor's son, a bastard boy but lovely the Aino nursed him with close, loving care like her own children, just to please her husband. Closing, Megs gave him some close attention too, the famous spearman struck behind his skull, just at the neck cord, the razor spear slicing straight up through the jaws, cutting away the tongue, he sank in the dust, teeth clenching the cold bronze. Euemon's son Eurypolis cut down brave Hypsena, son of lofty Delopian, a man the Trojans made Scamander's priest and worshipped like a god. But Euemon's royal son laid low his son Eurypolis, chasing Hypsena fleeing on before him, flailed with a sword, slashed the Trojan's shoulder and lopped away the massive bulk of Hypsena's arm, the bloody arm dropped to the earth, and red death came plunging down his eyes, and the strong force of fate. So they worked away in the rough assaults, but Diomed's, which side was the fighter on? You could not tell, did he rampage now with the Trojans or the Argives? Down the plain he stormed like a stream in spate, a rooting winter torrent sweeping away the dikes, the tight, piled dikes can't hold it back any longer, banks shoring the blooming vineyards cannot curb its course, a flash flood bursts as the rains from Zeus pour down their power, acre on acre the well-dug work of farmers crumbling under it, so under tidides force the Trojan columns panic now, no standing their ground, massed, packed as they were. 
but the shining archer Pandarus marked him storming down the plain, smashing the Trojan lines before him. Quickly he trained his reflex bow on Diam's charging straight ahead he shot. He struck him full in the right shoulder, under the breastplate's hollow the ripping point tore deep, shearing its way through, armor splattered with blood as Pandarus triumphed, shouting over Tidides wildly, move up, attack, my high-hearted Trojans, lash your stallions. Look, the Achaean champion's badly wounded, I shot him down, I swear he won't last long, if the archer really sped me here from Lycia. Bragging so, but the whizzing arrow had not brought him down. Diams just drew back beside his car and team and stood there calling Sthenelus, Capania's son, quick, Sthenelus. Down from the car, my friend, pull this wretched arrow from my shoulder. Sthenelus sprang from the car, hit the ground and standing beside him, pulled the tearing arrow clean on through the wound and blood came shooting out like a red lance through the supple mesh shirt. And Diam's lord of the war cry prayed aloud, Hear me, daughter of Zeus whose shield is thunder, tireless one, Athena. If you ever stood by father with all your love amidst the blaze of battle, stand by me do me a favor now, Athena. Bring that man into range and let me spear him. He's wounded me off guard and now he triumphs, he boasts one won't look long on the light of day. So Tydides prayed and Athena heard his prayer, put spring in his limbs, his feet, his fighting hands and close beside him winged him on with a flight of orders, now take heart, Diams, fight it out with the Trojans. Deep in your chest I've put your father's strength. He never quaked, that Tydeus, that great horseman, what force the famous shields man used to wield. Look, I've lifted the mist from off your eyes that's blurred them up to now, so you can tell a god from man on sight. So now if a god comes up to test your mettle, you must not fight the immortal powers head on, all but one of the deathless gods, that is, if Aphrodite daughter of Zeus slips into battle, she's the one to stab with your sharp bronze spear. Her eyes bright, Athena soared away and Tydeus' son went charging back to the front line of champions. Now, long ablaze as he was to fight the Trojans, triple the fury seized him claw mad as a lion some shepherd tending woolly flocks in the field has just grazed, a lion leaping into the fold, but he hasn't killed him, only spurred his strength and helpless to beat him off the man scurries for shelter, leaving his flocks panicked, lost as the ramping beast mauls them thick and fast, piling corpse on corpse and in one furious bound clears the fenced yard, so raging Diams mauled the Trojans. There, he killed Astinus, then Hypion, a frontline captain. One he stabbed with a bronze lance above the nipple, the other his heavy sword hacked at the collarbone, right on the shoulder, cleaving the whole shoulder clear of neck and back. And he left them there, dead, and he made a rush at Abars and Polyidus, sons of Eurydamas, an aged reader of dreams, but the old prophet read no dreams for them when they set out for Troydiams laid them low then swung to attack the two sons of Phenops, Hardy Xanthus and Thune, both men grown tall as their father shrank away with wasting age, he'd never breed more sons to leave his riches to. The son of Tydeus killed the two of them on the spot, he ripped the dear life out of both and left their father tears and wrenching grief. Now he'd never welcome his two sons home from war, alive in the flesh, and distant kin would carve apart their birthright. Next Diams killed two sons of Dardan Priam careening on in a single car, Echemon and Chromius. As a lion charges cattle, calves and heifers browsing the deep glades and snaps their necks, so Tydides pitched them both from the chariot, gave them a mauling gave them little choice, quickly stripped their gear and passed their team to his men to lash back to the ships. Smashing the lines of fighters now. But Aeneas marked it all and oblivious to the rain of spears he waded in, hunting for Pandarus, hoping to find the archer. Find him he did, Lycaon skilled, fearless son, and went right up and challenged him to his face, Pandarus, where's your bow, your winged arrows, your archer's glory? No Trojan your rival here, no Lycian can claim to be your better, no, so up with you now. Lift your hands to Zeus, you whip an arrow against that man, whoever he is who routs us, wreaking havoc against us, cutting the legs from under squads of good brave men. Unless it's a god who smolders at our troops, enraged at a right we failed, when a god's enraged there's thunder at our heads. And Lycaon's shining son took up the challenge, Aeneas, counsellor of the Trojans armed in bronze, he looks like Tydeus' son to me in every way, I know his shield, the hollow eyes of his visor, his team, I've watched them closely. And still I could never swear he's not a god. But if he's the man I think he is, Tydeus gallant son, he rages so with a god beside him not alone, no, a god with his shoulders shrouded round in cloud who deflects my shaft to a less mortal spot. 
I had already whipped an arrow into him, caught him square in the right shoulder too, just where the breastplate leaves the armpit bare, and I thought I'd sent him down to the house of death but I've still not laid him low. So it is some god rampaging. And here I am, no chariot, no team to speed me on. But back in Lycane's halls are eleven war cars, beauties all, fresh from the smith and fire new and blankets spread across them. And beside each a brace of stallions standing poised and pouring, champing their oats and barley glistening white. Over and over farther, the old spearman Lycane urged me, setting out from his well-built halls, take those teams and cars, he told me, mount up, lead the Trojans into the jolting shocks of battle. But would I listen? So much the better if I had I had to spare my teams. They'd never starve for fodder crammed with the fighters' bread to eat their fill. So I left them there, I made it to Troy on foot, trusting my bows and arrows, and a lot of good I was to get from them. Already I've let fly at two of their best men, Diams and Menelaus, I've hit them both, and the blood gushed from both, direct hits, but I only roused their fury. What bad luck, to snatch this curved bow off its peg that day I march my Trojans hard to your lovely town of Troy, to please Prince Hector. But if I get home again and set my eyes on my native land, my wife and my fine house with the high vaulting roof, let some stranger cut my head off then and there if I don't smash this bow and fling it in the fire, the gear I packed is worthless as the wind. Aeneas the Trojan captain checked him sharply, no talk of turning for home. No turning the tide till we wheel and face this man with team and car and fight it out with weapons hand to hand. Come, up with you now, climb aboard my chariot. So you can see the breed of Troza's team, their flair for their own terrain as they gallop back and forth, one moment in flight, the next in hot pursuit. They'll sweep us back to the city, back to safety if Zeus' hands tidy us some the glory once again. Quick, take up the whip and glittering reins. I'll dismount from the car and fight on foot, or you engage the man and leave the team to me. The shining son of Lycane made the choice, take up either reins yourself, Aeneas. Do, they're your team, they'll haul your curving chariot so much better under the driver they know best if we have to beat retreat from diamonds. God forbid they panic, skittish with fear, buck and never pull us out of the fighting, missing your own voice as tidy as sun attacks, he'll kill us both and drive them off as prizes. So drive them yourself, your chariot and your team and let him charge, I'll take him on with a sharp spear. Both men agreed, boarding the blazoned chariot, wildly heading their races at diamonds now. Capanius' good son Stenela saw them coming and quickly alerted Diams, warnings flying, tidides, joy of my heart, dear comrade, look. I see two men and they are bearing down to fight you. Their power's enormous, one's a master archer, Pandarus, son of Lycane, so he boasts. The other's Aeneas, claims Anchises' blood, the noble Anchises, but his mother's Aphrodite. Come, up you go in our chariot, give ground now. No charging the front ranks, you might lose your life. But powerful Diams froze him with a glance, not a word of retreat. You'll never persuade me. It's not my nature to shrink from battle, cringe in fear with the fighting strength still steady in my chest. I shrink from mounting our chariot no retreat on foot as I am, I'll meet them man to man. Athena would never let me flinch. Those two? Their horses will never sweep them clear of us, not both men, though one or the other may escape. One more thing, take it to heart, I tell you, if part of Athena's plan gives me the honor to kill them both, you check our races here, you lash them fast to our rails then dash for Aeneas' horses, don't forget, drive them out of the Trojan lines and into ours. They are the very strain far-seeing Zeus gave Troas, payment in full for stealing Ganymede, Troas' son, the purest, strongest breed of all the stallions under the dawn and light of day. Lord Anchises stole from that fine stock behind Laomedon's back, Troza's grandson and heir to Troza's teams, he put some mares to the lusty stallions once and they fold him a run of six in his royal house. For he kept for himself, to rear in his own stalls, but the two you see in action he gave Aeneas, both of them driving terrors. Would to God we'd take them both, we'd win ourselves great fame. Wavering back and forth as their two attackers closed in a rush, whipping that purebred team along and Pandarus shouted first, what mad bravado, lofty tidiest boy will brave it out. So, my arrow failed to bring you down, my tearing shot. Now for a spear, we'll see if this can kill you. Shaft poised, he hurled and its long shadow flew and it struck Tidide's shield, the brazen spearhead winging, drilling right on through to his breastplate, 
Pandarus yelling over him wildly now, you're hit clean through the side. You won't last long, I'd say, now the glory's mine. But never shaken, staunch Diamond shot back, no hit you missed. But the two of you will never quit this fight, I'd say, till one of you drops and dies and gluts with blood as who hacks at men behind his rawhide shield. With that he hurled and Athena drove the shaft and it split the archer's nose between the eyes, it cracked his glistening teeth, the tough bronze cut off his tongue at the roots, smashed his jaw and the point came ripping out beneath his chin. He pitched from his car, armor clanged against him, a glimmering blaze of metal dazzling round his back, the purebreds reared aside, hoofs pawing the air and his life and power slipped away on the wind. Aeneas sprang down with his shield and heavy spear, fearing the Argives might just drag away the corpse, somehow, somewhere. Aeneas straddled the body, proud in his fighting power like some lion, shielded the corpse with spear and round buckler, burning to kill off any man who met him face to face and he loosed a blood-curdling cry. Just as Diams hefted a boulder in his hands, a tremendous feat, no two men could hoist it, weak as men are now, but all on his own he raised it high with ease, flung it and struck Aeneas thigh where the hip bone turns inside the pelvis, the joint they call the cup, it smashed the socket, snapped both tendons too and the jagged rock tore back the skin in shreds. The great fighter sank to his knees, bracing himself with one strong forearm planted against the earth, and the world went black as night before his eyes. And now the prince, the captain of men Aeneas would have died on the spot if Zeus's daughter had not marked him quickly, his mother Aphrodite who bore him to King Anchises tending cattle once. Round her beloved son her glistening arms went streaming, flinging her shining robe before him, only a fold but it blocked the weapons hurtling toward his body. She feared some Argive fast with chariot team might hurl bronze in his chest and rip his life out. She began to bear her dear son from the fighting, but Capania's son did not forget the commands the lord of the war cry put him under. Sthenelus checked his own racers clear of the crash of battle, lashed them tight to his chariot rails with reins then dashed for Aeneas' glossy full main team and drove them out of the Trojan lines and into his. He passed them on to Deipolis, a friend in arms he prized beyond all comrades his own age their minds worked as one to drive to the ships as Sthenelus mounted behind his own chariot now, seized the glittering reins and whipped his team. His strong-hoofed horses ahead at breakneck speed, rearing, plunging to overtake his captain Diams but he with his ruthless bronze was hunting Aphrodite Diams, knowing her for the coward goddess she is, none of the mighty gods who marshal men to battle, neither Athena nor any o raider of cities, not at all, but once he caught her. Stalking her through the onslaught, gallant Tydeus' offspring rushed her, lunging out, thrusting his sharp spear at her soft, limp wrist and the brazen point went slashing through her flesh, tearing straight through the fresh immortal robes the graces themselves had made her with their labor. He gouged her just where the wrist bone joins the palm and immortal blood came flowing quickly from the goddess, the ichor that courses through their veins, the blessed gods, they eat no bread, they drink no shining wine, and so the gods are bloodless, so we call them deathless. A piercing shriek she reeled and dropped her son. But Phoebus Apollo plucked him up in his hands and swathed him round in a swirling dark mist for fear some Argive fast with chariot team might hurl bronze in his chest and rip his life out. But Diams shouted after her, shattering war cries. Daughter of Zeus, give up the war, your lust for carnage. So, it's not enough that you lure defenseless women to their ruin? Haunting the fighting, are you? Now I think you'll cringe at the hint of war if you get wind of battle far away. So he mocked and the goddess fled the front, beside herself with pain. But Iris quick as the wind took up her hand and led her from the fighting, racked with agony, her glowing flesh blood dark. And off to the left of battle she discovered Ars, violent Ars sitting there at ease, his long spear braced on a cloud bank, flanked by racing stallions. Aphrodite fell to her knees, over and over begged her dear brother to lend his golden bridal team, oh dear brother, help me. Give me your horses, so I can reach Olympus, the god's steep stronghold. I'm wounded, the pain's too much, a mortal speared me, that daredevil Diams, he'd fight Father Zeus. Her brother Ars gave her the golden bridal team. Heart writhing in pain, she climbed aboard the car and Iris climbed beside her, seized the reins, whipped the team to a run and on the horses flew, holding nothing back. In a moment they had reached the immortal stronghold, Steep Olympus. Windquick Iris curbed the team and loosing them from the chariot threw ambrosial fodder down before their hoofs. The deathless Aphrodite sank in Dion's lap and her mother, folding her daughter in her arms, stroked her gently, whispered her name and asked, who has abused you now, dear child, tell me, who of the sons of heaven so unfeeling, cruel. 
Why, it's as if they had caught you in public, doing something wrong. An Aphrodite who loves eternal laughter sobbed in answer, the son of Tydeus stabbed me, Diams, that overweening, insolent, all because I was bearing off my son from the fighting. Aeneas, dearest to me of all the men alive. Look down. It's no longer ghastly war for Troy and Achaea, now, I tell you, the Argives fight the gods. Dion the light and loveliest of immortals tried to calm her, patience, O oh my child. Bear up now, despite your heart's at grief. How many gods who hold the halls of Olympus have had to endure such wounds from mortal men, whenever we try to cause each other pain? Ours had to endure it, when giant Ephialtes and Otus, sons of Aluus, bound him in chains he could not burst, trust him up in a brazen cauldron, thirteen months. And despite the gods' undying lust for battle ours might have wasted away there on the spot if the monster's stepmother, beautiful Erebia had not sent for Hermes, and out of the cauldron Hermes stole him away the war god breathing his last, all but broken down by the ruthless iron chains. And Hera endured it too, that time Amphitryon's son, mighty Heracles hit her deep in the right breast with a three-barbed shaft, and pain seized her, nothing calmed the pain. Even tremendous Hades had to endure that flying shaft like all the rest, when the same man, the son of thunder-shielded Zeus, shot him in pylos, there with the troops of battle dead, and surrendered death to pain. But Hades made his way to craggy Olympus, climbed to the house of Zeus, stabbed with agony, grief struck to the heart, the shaft driven into his massive shoulder grinding down his spirit. But the healer applied his pain-killing drugs and sealed Hades wound, he was not born to die. Think of that breakneck Heracles, his violent work, not a care in the world for all the wrongs he'd done, he and his arrows raking the gods who hold Olympus. But the man who attacked you? The great goddess fiery-eyed Athena set him on, that fool, doesn't the son of Tydeus know, down deep, the man who fights the gods does not live long? Nor do his children ride his knees with cries of, father, home at last from the wars and heat of battle. So now let Diams, powerful as he is, be on his guard for fear a better soldier than you engage him, for fear his wife, Egealia, Adrastus' daughter, for all her self-control, will wail through the nights and wake her beloved servants out of sleep, the gallant wife in tears, longing for him, her wedded husband, the best of the Achaeans, Diams' breaker of horses. Soothing words, and with both her hands Dion gently wiped the ichor from Aphrodite's arm and her wrist healed at once, her stark pain ebbed away. But Hera and great Athena were looking on and with mocking words began to provoke the father, Athena leading off with taunts, her eyes bright, Father Zeus, I wonder if you would fume at me if I ventured a bold guess? Our goddess of love, I'd swear she's just been rousing another Argive, another beauty to pant and lust for Trojans, those men the goddess loves to such despair. Stroking one of the Argive women's rippling gowns she's pricked her limp wrist on a golden pinpoint. So she mocked, and the father of gods and mortals smiled broadly, calling the golden Aphrodite over, fighting is not for you, my child, the works of war. See to the works of marriage, the slow fires of longing. Athena and blazing ours will deal with all the bloodshed. And now as the high gods bantered back and forth Diams, loosing his war cry, charged Aeneas, though what he saw was Lord Apollo himself, guarding, spreading his arms above the fighter, but even before the mighty god he would not flinch. Tydides reared and hurled himself again and again, trying to kill Aeneas, strip his famous armor. Three times he charged, frenzied to bring him down, three times Apollo battered his gleaming shield back, then at Tydides' fourth assault like something superhuman, the archer who strikes from worlds away shrieked out, a voice of terror, think, Diams, shrink back now. Enough of this madness striving with the gods. We are not of the same breed, we never will be, the deathless gods and men who walk the earth. Menacing so that Tydia's son pulled back, just a little, edging clear of the distant deadly archer's rage. And Apollo swept Aeneas up from the onslaught and set him down on the sacred heights of Pergamus, the crest where the god's own temple had been built. There in the depths of the dark forbidden chamber Leto and Artemis who showers flights of arrows healed the man and brought him back to glory. But the lord of the silver bow devised a phantom, like Aeneas to the life, wearing his very armor, and round that phantom Trojans and brave Achaeans went at each other, hacking the oxides round their chests, the bucklers full and round, skin shields, tassels flying. But Phoebus Apollo called to blazing ours, 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 destroyer of men, reeking blood, stormer of ramparts, can't you go and drag that man from the fighting? That daredevil Diams, he'd fight Father Zeus. He's just assaulted love, he stabbed her wrist like something superhuman he even charged at me. With that. 
Apollo settled onto Pergamus Heights while murderous Ars, wading into the fighting, spurred the Trojan columns onto mass attack. Shaped like the runner Akamas, Prince of Thrace, Ars challenged the sons of Priam with a vengeance, you royal sons of Priam, monarch dear to the gods, how long will you let Achaeans massacre your army? Until they are battling round your well-built gates. A man is down we prized on a par with noble Hector, Aeneas, proud Anchise's son, up with you now, rescue him from the crash of battle. Save our comrade. As ours whipped the fighting spirit in each man sarped and taunted Hector, Hector, where has it gone, that high courage you always carried in your heart? No doubt you bragged that you could hold your city without an army and Trojan allies, all on your own, just with your sister's husbands and your brothers. But where are they now? I look, I can't find one. They cringe and cower like hounds circling a lion. We your allies here we do your fighting for you. And I myself, Hector, your ally to the death, a good long way I came from distant Lycia, far from the Xanthus rapids where I left my loving wife, my baby son, great riches too, the lasting envy of every needy neighbor. And still I lead our Lycians into battle. Myself? I chafe to face my man, full force, though there's not a scrap of mine for looting here, no cattle or gold the foe could carry off. But you, you just stand there don't even command the rest to brace and defend their wives. Beware the toils of war, the mesh of the huge dragnet sweeping up the world, before you're trapped, your enemies prey and plunder, soon they'll raise your sturdy citadel to the roots. All this should obsess you, Hector, night and day. You should be begging the men who lead your allies' famous ranks to stand and fight for all they are worth, you'll ward off all the blame they hurl against you. And Sarpedon's charge cut Hector to the core. Down he leapt from his chariot fully armed, hit the ground and brandishing two sharp spears went striding down his lines, ranging flank to flank, driving his fighters into battle, rousing grisly war, and round the Trojans' world, bracing to meet the Argives face to face, but the Argives' closed ranks, did not cave in. Remember the wind that scatters the dry chaff, sweeping it over the sacred threshing floor, the men winnowing hard and blonde Demeter culling grain from dry husk in the rough and gusting wind and under it all the heaps of chaff are piling white. So white the Achaeans turned beneath the dust storm now, pelting across their faces, kicked up by horses' hoofs to the clear bronze sky the battle joined again. Charioteers swung chariots round, thrust the powerful fist of fury straight ahead and murderous as keen to help the Trojans shrouded the carnage over in dense dark night, lunging at all points, carrying out the commands of Phoebus Apollo, lord of the golden sword, who ordered Ars to whip the Trojans' war lust once he spotted Athena veering off the lines, great pallors who'd rushed to back the Argives. Out of his rich guarded chamber the god himself launched Aeneas now, driving courage into his heart and the captain took his place amidst his men and how they thrilled to see him still alive, safe, unharmed and marching back to their lines, his soul ablaze for war, but his men asked him nothing. The labor of battle would not let them, more labor urged by the god of the silver bow and man-destroying ours and strife flaring on, headlong on. The Achaeans? The two Eantes, Tydides and Odyssea spurred them on to attack. The troops themselves had no fear, no dread of the Trojans' power and breakneck charges, no, they stood their ground like heavy thunderheads stacked up on the towering mountaintops by Crona's son, stock still in a windless calm when the raging north wind and his gusty ripping friends that had screamed down to rout dark clouds have fallen dead asleep. So staunch they stood the Trojan onslaught, never shrinking once as a tribes ranged the ranks, shouting out commands, now be men, my friends. Courage, come, take heart. Dread what comrades say of you here in bloody combat. When men dread that, more men come through alive, when soldiers break and run, goodbye glory, goodbye all defences. A flash, a sudden hurl and a tried speared a champion out in front, it was Prince Aeneas comrade in arms day Coon, Pergasus son the Trojans prized like Priam's sons, quick as he always was to join the forward ranks. Now his shield took powerful Agamemnon's spear but failed to deflect it, straight through it smashed, bronze splitting his belt and plunging down his guts, he fell, thundering, armor ringing against him. There, Aeneas replied in kind and killed two Argive captains, Diacles two sons, Orsolochus flanking Crethon. Their father lived in the fortress town of Phera, a man of wealth and worth, born of Alpheus river running wide through Pilian hills, the stream that sired Ortolochus to rule their many men. Autolochus sired Diacles, that proud heart, and Diacles bred Orsolochus twinned with Crethon drilled for any fight. 
and reaching their prime they joined the Argive sailing the black ships outward bound for the stallion land of Troy, all for the sons of Atreus, to fight to the end and win their honor back, so death put an end to both, wrapped them both in night. Fresh as two young lions off on the mountain ridges, twins reared by a lioness deep in the dark glades, that ravage shepherd steadings, mauling the cattle and fat sheep till it's their turn to die hacked down by the cleaving bronze blades in the shepherd's hands. So here the twins were laid low at Aenea's hands, down they crashed like lofty pine trees axed. Both down but Menelaus pitted them both, yes, and out for blood he burst through the front, helmed in fiery bronze, shaking his spear, and Ars fury drove him, Ars hoping to see him crushed at Aenea's hands. Antilochus marked him now, great Nestor's son went racing across the front himself, terrified for the lord of armies, what if he were killed? Their hard campaigning just might come to grief. As Aeneas and Menelaus came within arm's reach, waving wetted spears in each other's faces, nerved to fight it out, Antilochus rushed in, tensing shoulder to shoulder by his captain now, and Aeneas shrank from battle, fast as he was in arms, when he saw that pair of fighters side by side, standing their ground against him. Once they dragged the bodies back to their lines they dropped the luckless twins in companions' open arms and round they swung again to fight in the first ranks. And next they killed Pylee means tough as ours, a captain heading the Paphlagonian shields men, hot-blooded men. Menelaus the famous spearman stabbed him right where he stood, the spearpoint pounding his collarbone to splinters. Antilochus killed his charioteer and steady henchman Maiden, a Timnius strapping son, just wheeling his racers round as Antilochus winged a rock and smashed his elbow, out of his grip the reins white with ivory flew and slipped to the ground and tangled in the dust. Antilochus sprang, he plunged a sword in his temple and Maiden, gasping, hurled from his bolted car face first, head and shoulders stuck in a dune a good long time for the sand was soft and deep, his lucky day, till his own horses trampled him down, down flat as Antilochus lashed them hard and drove them back to Achaea's waiting ranks. But Hector marked them across the lines and rushed them now with a cry and Trojan shock troops backed him full strength. And Ars led them in with the deadly queen Enio bringing uproar on, the savage chaos of battle, the god of combat wielding his giant shaft in hand, now ranging ahead of Hector, now behind him. Ars there, and for all his war cries Diam shrank at the sight, as a man at a loss, helpless, crossing a vast plain halts short at a river rapid surging out to sea, takes one look at the water roaring up in foam and springs back with a leap. So he recoiled, shouting out to comrades, O oh my friends, what fools we were to marvel at wondrous Hector, what a spearman, we said, and what a daring fighter. But a god goes with him always, beating off disaster, look, that's ours beside him now, just like a mortal. Give ground, but faces fronting the Trojans always, no use trying to fight the gods in force. So he warned as the Trojans charged them, hard and Hector, lunging, leveled a pair of men who knew the joy of battle, riding a single chariot, Menestes and Ancialus. Down they went and the great Arjax pitted both, he strode to their side and loomed there, loosed a gleaming spear and struck down Amphius, Seliga's son who had lived at ease in Pesus, rich in possessions, rich in rolling wheatland. But destiny guided Amphius on, a comrade sworn to the cause of Priam and all of Priam's sons. Now giant Arjak speared him through the belt, deep in the guts the long, shadowy shaft stuck and down he fell with a crash as glorious Arjax rushed to strip his armor, Trojans showering spears against him, points glittering round him, his shield taking repeated hits. He dug his heel in the corpse, yanked his own bronze out but as for the dead man's burnished gear no hope. The giant was helpless to rip it off his back. Enemy weapons beating against him, worse, he dreaded the Trojans too, swarming round him, a tough ring of them, brave and bristling spears, massing, rearing over their comrade's body now and rugged, strong and proud as the great Arjax was, they shoved him back, he gave ground, staggering, reeling. So fighters worked away in the grim shocks of war. And Heracles' own son, Tlepolemus tall and staunch, his strong fate was driving him now against Sarpedon, a man like a god. Closing quickly, coming head to head the sun and the sun son of Zeus who marshal storms, Tlepolemus opened up to taunt his enemy first. Sarpedon, master strategist of the Lycians, what compels you to cringe and cower here? You raw recruit, green at the skills of battle. They lie when they say you're born of storming Zeus. Look at yourself. How short you fall of the fighters sired by Zeus in the generations long before us. Why, think what they say of mighty Heracles, there was a man, my father, that dauntless, furious spirit, that lion heart. 
He once sailed here for Laomedon's blooded horses, with just six ships and smaller crews than yours, true, but he raised the walls of Troy, he widowed all her streets. You with your coward's heart, your men dying round you. You're no bulwark come out of Lycia, I can tell you, no help to Trojans here. For all your power, soldier, crushed at my hands you'll breach the gates of death. But Sarpedon the Lycian captain faced him down, right you are, Tlepolemus. Your great father destroyed the sacred heights of Troy, thanks, of course, to a man's stupidity, proud Laomedon. That fool, he rewarded all his kindness with abuse, never gave him the mares he'd come so far to win. But the only thing you'll win at my hands here, I promise you, is slaughter and black doom. Gouged by my spear you'll give me glory now, you'll give your life to the famous horseman death. In fast reply Tlepolemus raised his ashen spear and the same moment shafts flew from their hands and Sarpedon hit him square across the neck, the spear went ramming through pure agony, black night came swirling down across his eyes. But Tlepolemus' shaft had struck Sarpedon too, the home tip of the weapon hitting his left thigh, ferocious, razoring into flesh and scraping bone, but his father beat off death a little longer. Heroic Sarpedon, his loyal comrades bore him out of the fighting quickly, weighed down by the heavy spears half dragging on. But hurrying so, no one noticed or even thought to wrench the ashen javelin from his thigh so the man could hobble upright. On they rushed, bent on the work of tending to his body. Tlepolemus, far across the lines the armed Achaeans hauled him out of the fight, and seasoned Odysseus saw it, his brave spirit steady, ablaze for action now. What should he do, he racked his heart and soul, lunge at Prince Sarpedon, son of storming Zeus, or go at the Lycians' mass and kill them all. But no, it was not the gallant Odysseus' fate to finish Zeus's rugged son with his sharp bronze, so Pallas swung his fury against the Lycian front. Whirling, killing Coeranus, Chromius and Alaster, killing Alcander and Halius, Pritanus and Numon, and stalwart Odysseus would have killed still more but tall Hector, his helmet flashing, marked him quickly, plowed through the front, helmed in fiery bronze, filling the Argives' hearts with sudden terror. And Zeus's son Sarpedon rejoiced to see him striding past and begged him in his pain, son of Priam, don't leave me lying here, such easy prey for the Danans protect me. Later I'll bleed to death inside your walls. Clearly it's not my fate to journey home again to the fatherland I love, to bring some joy to my dear wife, my baby son. But Hector, his helmet flashing, answered nothing he swept past him, Hector burning to thrust the Argives back at once and tear the life and soul out of whole battalions. But Sarpedon's loyal comrades laid him down, a man like a god beneath a fine spreading oak sacred to Zeus whose shield is banked with clouds. The veteran Pelagon, one of his closest aides, pushed the shaft of Ashwood out through his wound, his spirit left him a mist poured down his eyes, but he caught his breath again. A gust of the north wind blowing round him carried back the life breath he had gasped away in pain. But the Argive fighters? Facing Ars power and Hector helmed in bronze, they neither turned and ran for their black ships nor traded blows with enemies man to man. Backing over and over, the Argives gave ground, seeing the lord of battles lead the Trojan onset. Who was the first they slaughtered, who the last, the brazen god of war and Hector son of Priam? Teuthras first, Orestes lasher of stallions next, an Aetolian spearman Trechus, Enomors and Helenus, Enop's son, and Oresbia cinched with shining belt who had lived in Hyle hoarding his great wealth, his estate asloped the shores of Lake Cephasus, and round him Boeotians held the fertile plain. But soon as the white-armed goddess Hera saw the mauling Argive units caught in the bloody press, she winged her words at Pallas, what disaster. Daughter of storming Zeus, tireless one, Athena, how hollow our vow to Menelaus that he would sack the mighty walls of Troy before he sailed for home, if we let murderous ours rampage on this way. Up now, set our minds on our own fighting fury. Hera's challenge, and goddess Athena, her eyes afire, could not resist. Hera queen of the gods, daughter of giant Cronus, launched the work, harnessed the golden bridal team and he quickly rolled the wheels to the chariot, paired wheels with their eight spokes all bronze, and bolted them on at both ends of the iron axle. Fine wheels with fellies of solid, deathless gold and round them running rims of bronze clamped fast, a marvel to behold. The silver hub spin round on either side of the chariot's woven body, gold and silver lashings strapping it tight, double rail sweeping along its deep full curves and the yoke pole jutting forward, gleaming silver. There at the tip she bound the gorgeous golden yoke, she fastened the gorgeous golden breast straps next and under the yoke Queen Hera led the horses, racers blazing for war and the piercing shrieks of battle. 
Then Athena, child of Zeus whose shield is thunder, letting fall her supple robe at the father's threshold, rich brocade, stitched with her own hands labor, donned the battle shirt of the Lord of Lightning, buckled her breastplate geared for wrenching war and over her shoulders slung her shield, all tassels flaring terror panic mounted high in a crown around it, hate and defense across it, assault to freeze the blood and right in there midst the gorgon's monstrous head, that rippling dragon. Horror, sign of storming Zeus. Then over her brows Athena placed her golden helmet fronted with four knobs and forked with twin horns, engraved with the fighting men of a hundred towns. Then onto the flaming chariot palace set her feet and seized her spear-weighted, heavy, the massive shaft she wields to break the battle lines of heroes the mighty father's daughter storms against. A crack of the whip, the goddess Hera lashed the team, and all on their own force the gates of heaven thundered open, kept by the seasons, guards of the vaulting sky and Olympus heights empowered to spread the massing clouds or close them round once more. Now straight through the great gates she drove the team, whipping them on full tilt until they came to Zeus the son of Cronus sitting far from the other gods, throned on the topmost crag of rugged ridged Olympus. And halting her horses near, the white-armed Hera called out at once to the powerful son of Cronus, pressing home her questions. Father Zeus, look, aren't you incensed at ours and all his brutal work? Killing so many brave Achaeans for no good reason, not a shred of decency, just to wound my heart. While there they sit at their royal ease, exulting, the goddess of love and Apollo lord of the silver bow, they loosed this manic ours, he has no sense of justice. Father Zeus. I wonder if you would fume at me if I hurled a stunning blow at the god of war and drove him from the fighting? Zeus the father who marshals ranks of storm clouds gave commands, leap to it then. Launch Athena against him, the queen of plunder, she's the one, his match, a marvel at bringing ours down in pain. So he urged and the white-armed goddess Hera obeyed at once. And again she lashed her team and again the stallions flew, holding nothing back, careering between the earth and starry skies as far as a man's glance can pierce the horizon's misting haze, a scout on a watchtower who scans the wine-dark sea, so far do the soaring, thundering horses of the gods leap at a single stride. And once they reach the plains of Troy where the two rivers flow, where Simwar and Scamander rush together, the white-armed goddess Hera reigned her team, loosing them from the chariot yoke and round them poured a dense shrouding mist and before their hoofs the Simwar sprang ambrosial grass for them to graze. The two immortals stepped briskly as wild doves, quivering, keen to defend the fighting men of Argos. Once they gained the spot where the most and bravest stood, flanking strong Diam's breaker of wild stallions, massed like a pride of lions tearing raw flesh or ramping boars whose fury never flags, the white-armed goddess Hera rose and shouted loud as the brazen voice of great lunged Stentor who cries out with the blast of fifty other men. Shame. Disgrace. You Argives, you degraded, splendid in battle dress, pure sham. As long as brilliant Achilles stalked the front no Trojan would ever venture beyond the Dardan gates, they were so afraid of the man's tremendous spear. Now they are fighting far away from the city, right by your hollow ships. So Hera trumpeted, lashing the nerve and fighting fury in each man as Athena, her eyes blazing, made for diamonds. Hard by his team and car she found the king, cooling the wound that Pandarus' arrow dealt him. Sweat from under the heavy buckler's flat strap had rubbed him raw, he was chafed and his arm ached from lifting up the strap, wiping off the blood and the dark clots. Laying hold of the yoke that bound his team, the goddess Pallas started, so, Tidia's son is half the size of his father, and he was short and slight but Tidius was a fighter. Even then, when I forbade him to go to war or make a show of himself in others' eyes, that time, alone, apart from his men, he marched the message into Thebes, filled with hordes of the bands, I told him to banquet in their halls and eat in peace. But he always had that power, that courage from the first, and so he challenged the brave young blades of Thebes to tests of strength and beat them all with ease, I urge him on with so much winning force. But you, Tydides, I stand by you as well, I guard you too. And with all good will I say, fight it out with the Trojans here. But look at you, fatigue from too much charging has sapped your limbs, that or some lifeless fear has paralyzed you now. So you're no offspring of Tydeus, the gallant, battle-hardened Aeneas' son. And powerful Diams bowed to her at once, well I know you, goddess, daughter of storming Zeus, and so I will tell you all, gladly. I'll hide nothing. It's not some lifeless fear that paralyzes me now, no flinching from combat either. 
it's your own command still ringing in my ears, forbidding me to fight the immortals head on, all but one of the blessed gods, that is, if Aphrodite daughter of Zeus slips into battle, she's the one to stab with my sharp bronze spear. So now, you see, I have given ground myself and told my comrades to mass around me here. Too well I know that ours leads the charge. But the goddess roused him on, her eyes blazing, true son of Tydeus, Diams, joy of my heart. Forget the orders nothing to fear, my friend, neither ours nor any other god. You too, I'll urge you on with so much winning force. Up now. Lash your racing horses at ours first, strike him at close range, no shrinking away here before that headlong ours. Just look at the maniac, born for disaster, double dealing, lying two faced god, just now he promised me and Hera, the war god swore he'd fight the Trojans, stand behind the Argives. But now, look, he's leading the Trojan rampage, his pledges thrown to the winds. With that challenge, Athena levered Sthenelus out the back of the car. A twist of her wrist and the man hit the ground, springing aside as the goddess climbed aboard, blazing to fight beside the shining diamonds. The big oaken axle groaned beneath the weight, bearing a great man and a terrifying goddess, and Pallas Athena seized the reins and whip, lashing the racing horses straight at ours. The god was just stripping giant Perifa's bear, the Aetolian's best fighter, Achesius' noble son, the blood-smeared ours was tearing off his gear but Athena donned the dark helmet of death so not even Stark ours could see her now. But the butcher did see Tydeus' rugged son and he dropped gigantic Perifas on the spot where he'd just killed him, ripped his life away and ours whirled at the stallion-breaking diamonds, the two of them closing fast, charging face to face and the god thrust first, over Tydide's yoke and reins, with bronze spear burning to take the fighter's life. But Athena, her eyes afire, grabbed the flying shaft, flicked it over the car and off it flew for nothing, and after him Diams yelled his war cry, lunging out with his own bronze spear and Pallas rammed it home, deep in Ars' bowels where the belt cinched him tight. There Diams aimed and stabbed, he gouged him down his glistening flesh and wrenched the spear back out and the brazen god of war let loose a shriek, roaring, thundering loud as nine, ten thousand combat soldiers shriek with Ars' fury when massive armies clash. A shudder swept all ranks, Trojans and Argives both, terror struck by the shriek the god let loose, ours whose lust for slaughter never dies. But now, wild as a black cyclone twisting out of a cloud bank, building up from the day's heat, blasts and towers, so brazen ours looked to tidy as sun diamonds. Soaring up with the clouds to the broad sweeping sky he quickly gained the god's stronghold, steep Olympus, and settling down by the side of Cronus' great son Zeus, his spirit racked with pain, Ars displayed the blood, the fresh immortal blood that gushed from his wound, and burst out in a flight of self-pity. Father Zeus, aren't you incensed to see such violent brutal work? We everlasting gods. Our what chilling blows we suffer thanks to our own conflicting wills whenever we show these mortal men some kindness. And we all must battle you, you brought that senseless daughter into the world, that murderous curse forever bent on crimes. While all the rest of us, every god on Olympus bows down to you, each of us overpowered. But that girl, you never block her way with a word or action, never, you spur her on, since you, you gave her birth from your own head, that child of devastation. Just look at this reckless diams now, Athena spurred him on to rave against the gods. First he lunges at Aphrodite, stabs her hand at the wrist then charges me, even me, like something superhuman. But I, I'm so fast on my feet I saved my life. Else for a good long while I'd have felt the pain, writhing among the corpses there, or soldiered on, weak as a breathless ghost, beaten down by bronze. But Zeus who martial storm clouds lowered a dark glance and let loose at ours, no more, you lying, two-faced, no more sidling up to me, whining here before me. You, I hate you most of all the Olympian gods. Always dear to your heart, strife, yes, and battles, the bloody grind of war. You have your mother's uncontrollable rage incorrigible, that Hera, say what I will, I can hardly keep her down. Hera's urgings, I trust, have made you suffer this. But I cannot bear to see you agonize so long. You are my child. To me your mother bore you. If you had sprung from another god, believe me, and grown into such a blinding devastation, long ago you'd have dropped below the titans, deep in the dark pit. So great Zeus declared and ordered the healing god to treat the god of war. And covering over his wound with pain-killing drugs the healer cured him, the god was never born to die. Quickly as fig juice, pressed into bubbly, creamy milk, curdles it firm for the man who churns it round, so quickly he healed the violent rushing ours. 
and he washed him clean, dressed him in robes to warm his heart, and flanking the son of Cronus down he sat, as exultant in the glory of it all. And now the two returned to the halls of mighty Zeus, Hera of Argos, the ocean Athena, guard of armies, both had stopped the murderous as cutting men to pieces.